Um, so the, what I, my message today, or the idea I would like to share and maybe discuss more later, is that the future of natural history is going to heavily emphasize um, time and how e ecological systems change over time. And we can't talk about, I can't talk about natural history without also talking about um, ecology uh, as a science. And I think ecology has recently become a science of changing systems. So whether we directly work on climate change or not, I think when we read the introductions or abstracts of talks and papers, everyone is, is interested in understanding their system in the context of climate change or maybe land use change, changing spatial arrangements of systems, or maybe changing biodiversity through species loss or gain. Um, so ecology is a, a science of changing systems, and I would go. So I have gone and will go so far as to say, I think we have a shared purpose that perhaps allows us to redefine our science a little bit. We could define ecology now as the scientific understanding of how living systems grow, change, and persist. Um, and I don't think you'll find this in any textbook, but I think this is what we're doing. Um, and it represents a fairly substantial shift from where the field was a few decades ago, um, which I can characterize a little bit um, glibly as a set of different disciplines that maybe at times only shared the name ecology. So population, community, ecosystem, physiological ecology, natural history, conservation ecology, these are different disciplines with different textbooks, different journals, different terminologies, different main objectives, and even different criteria for what constitutes a good scientific contribution. Right? And yet, when you go to ESA, that is, that is the field that we supposedly shared. I think, though, we've moved out of this, and I think we're moving much toward a much more integrated science, and I find that really exciting. Um, and I think, because we're all interested in change, now we face this challenge of understanding change. What is change in natural systems? Things are changing all the time, so what is the change that we're concerned about from a human sustainability perspective, and what is normal? you know, ongoing change? That is not an easy question. So the outline for the talk, or where I'm gonna take us in the next few minutes, is to spend a few more minutes talking about um, temporal structure and how I see natural history being um, central to understanding that better. And then sort of two examples of temporal structure in an ecological systems at the community level, freshwater plankton example, and then seagrass communities, so I'm delighted that Emmett just uh, introduced us to those. Um, and then a little bit of wrap up. Okay, so back to where we were. Ecology, this scientific understanding of how living systems, which could be organisms, they could be cells, living systems can be populations, communities, ecosystems. So how do they grow, change, and persist? Clearly it's a multi-scale problem, um, a, a multi-scale problem. And central to those three keywords is time. Those are all three temporal processes. And I've shown a clock here because we measure time with a clock related to very regular movements of the planets, but no other species measures time this way. Most species experience or sort of count time, if you will, in, in, in there are several different ways. One way is development. So development is a one-way path through a series of events in an, organ, in an organization, maybe an organism. And in biology, understanding development has received incredible amounts of investment of intellectual and financial energy so that we can understand abnormal development and distinguish it from normal development. So I'll come back to this at the very end. Um, but the other way living organisms experience time, or one of the other major ways, is through repeated cycles in their physical or resource environment. These may be daily cycles, tidal cycles, um, or seasonal cycles. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about seasonal cycles now using the freshwater plankton community because this is the best model that I'm aware of for organizing our understanding about time in a system. So you've probably seen something like this. Uh, it, 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 a major component of this model is the spring bloom um, in phytoplankton systems. So uh, here we have abundance or biomass on the y-axis and then the different physical controls, and you can see sort of a seasonal variation. So before I go into the details on that, I wanna tell you about a little bit of the history of this model. So the, the spring bloom, of course, has been known about for a really long time, but in the 80s, uh, a group of, fight, of freshwater plankton ecologists got together, led by Uli Summer, and these, these people were working in Europe, and they, they had a synthesis meeting, essentially, 
And they were operating on the observation that more data on seasonality is collected than is ever published. And these freshwater researchers were working in temperate lakes. They under, each of them understood their system to be incredibly structured in time. Um, but what they didn't know was how, how regular is that structure? How, com how similar is it in my lake to your lake, to a lake in the tropics or somewhere else? They didn't have a shared vocabulary or conceptual framework, really, for comparing their systems, even though they knew time and order and time was really important. So their solution was to get together and hammer it up. And this paper, it's one of my favorite papers, it's been cited over 1,300 times. It's one of the most cited papers in freshwater plankton ecology. Um, and it's a, it's, a it's a list of 24 points. It's a verbal model. And, they, and each of those points is essentially a hypothesis that describes how uh, the system moves from one stage to the other. And I'll go with that in a second. But I just wanted to emphasize that what they did was get together and try to come up with this conceptual framework, and they were incredibly successful. They redefined the way freshwater ecologists think about their, eco their communities. So I don't have time to go through the whole thing, but I want to walk you through a couple aspects of this to illustrate um, the model. Oops. So for example, early on, everyone knew that in their system, zooplankton and phytoplankton were extremely rare in the winter, and that in the summer, in the, in the springtime, growth picked up and took off really fast. Now, did that happen because light limitation was eased, because temperature was uh, increasing, or because nutrients changed, and people had different opinions? So this model put forth the hypothesis they believed that it was light limitation. 30 years later, this has been tested and poked and prodded, and that still stands as the consensus that it is light. Temperature, other factors may indirectly affect light availability, but light starts the system going this way. The next thing that happens is tasty small cell phytoplankton grow really fast, because now they have, they're not light limited. And they grow really fast, and as soon as, as soon as food limitation is eased, zooplankton start growing really fast. They graze down their phyto. So here we have our spring bloom. Most of the energy that's fixed into the green food web happens in this couple of weeks. So the peak and the timing of this bloom is really important for everything that comes after. Uh, the zooplankton graze it down, and then you have a clear water phase, where zooplankton are both food limited and now fish predation becomes more important. And it goes on, there's some interesting things that happen later that I won't talk about right now. But the points I want to make about this model is that um, it, it beautifully balances top-down and bottom-up control in time. And key to this is that there's a space here where there, neither control is really strong. And you basically have unlimited growth, okay? So it's both control and lack of control in a particular order that matters. Um, this model is, it's a conceptual model, there's no data here that I'm showing you, but this model has led to natural history insights in this system um, over time. And one of the, my favorite ones has to do with this um, the zooplankton. So the, uh, the previous idea was that zooplankton had a hard time in the winter, most of them died, there were a few left, and as soon as it got uh, better food conditions, they grew exponentially from that low density. Well, once different researchers started testing this model in their systems, they realized that these zooplankton, in many cases, are growing too fast. They're growing faster than exponential growth from that low wintertime density. So it led them to go back to their systems and discover that there are many more act, uh, resting stages for zooplankton, and that those are, uh, zooplankton essentially are resting in both eggs and adult stages, and they're basically ready to go as soon as that food limitation eats. So it led to a whole, but much deeper appreciation of this winter ecology um, in the system. And then the last part, the last point I want to make here is freshwater ecologists now are, like everyone else, really interested in climate change impacts. And when they do their experiments and publish their research, they're referencing this model. So they're not just looking at changes in abundance over time with temperature or light. They're looking at changes in the timing of the peak, the magnitude, the distance between the peaks. They're really working with this temporal structure to understand effects on the whole system. And they're realizing that many of the things that happen in winter affect what happens through the whole year. So I think this is a pretty great model, and I think we could use this in some of our other systems that we work in. I know I could use it to understand seagrass. So um, I'll tell you right now, we don't have this model for seagrass yet, but I'll show you where we are in thinking about it as an effort to sort of try to put something like this together. And when I say we, this is really uh, squarely in the domain of what Emily Adamczyk, my PhD student, is working on. And also, um, we've been talking about this uh, among the Zen partners for years, because it, it's directly related to our challenge of when do we sample our sites 
uh, all across the world such that they are actually comparable to sites somewhere else. And how do we do that if we don't really understand the seasonality? So luckily, uh, you just had an introduction to the natural history of seagrass, so I'll, I can say something, I can add a point here. Um, eel, I also think of eelgrass, uh, since I work in the Pacific, I think of them as forests. Um, and they're hosting this vast biodiversity of invertebrate and vertebrate uh, consumers. Eelgrass uh, communities are incredibly diverse and incredibly productive, and they've been called the most productive uh, marine systems in terms of secondary productivity, or at least they're up there. And this productivity is not coming from the seagrass itself and temperate systems, it's coming from the algae that grow on and among the seagrass. <coughs> So we have um, a food chain, or a food, it's really a food web, but this is such a nice picture that Kareem Forbes, my student, made. Um, energy just shooting up through this food, food web um, by a, a very ephemeral, fast-growing food source. So this looks like a system that's going to be right for a temporal structure in this mix. So here are our players. Um, these, so these are all different species except for Zostra than what Emmett just showed you, and it allows me to make the point that another sign to me that there probably is um, important temporal structure is all over the world. We have these communities that form. They look pretty similar. The species are almost always completely different, except for the zostra. So here's our shiner perch. These are our, our fish that come in and graze. Um, epiphytes there growing on the eelgrass. There are our grazers, um, all different species. But I'll show you a few of these um, amphipods and uh, isopods and gastropods. And fish. So I like to say that. Um, Another way that eelgrass meadows are like a forest is that when you approach them and you're walking around in them, you probably don't see these grazers. And it's just like being in a forest when you're hiking through. You probably don't, you're, oh, you're not aware of the birds and the wildlife that's around you until you stop for quite a while, you stand still, and you watch. And then, or, and, and you can see these things in the seagrass too, or even better, you grab a fistful of seagrass and you go back to the lab. And you spend a little time with it and you'll find hundreds of invertebrates on a fistful of seagrass and dozens of species. Um, and these grazers are eaten by fish, and there usually are some types of fish that live in the eelgrass meadows for their whole life year round, and there's some other ones that come in just when they need to reproduce or grow or eat or be protected. And those are in turn eaten by birds and um, fish and other things. So in, try in working in seagrass in BC now, and I worked in seagrass systems in North Carolina, and then in Washington before that, so I've been working in the system actually for uh, almost 20 years, which seems like a long time. Um, the, I have come to these two questions that I think are really important, both for me and my system, but for understanding other people's systems. Um, and these are, you know, does the immense biodiversity and productivity of these seagrass-based food webs reflect this seasonal temporal structure? Um, it probably does, but how? And if so, if that's true, how should we sample these systems to detect the change over space and time? Um, most of us can't be out there all the time, every day. So how do we choose where and how and when to sample and what to sample? So um, I tried to put together sort of my version of what our seagrass model might look like, following in the spirit of the PEG model, the plankton model, though not exactly as detailed. And it, um, this is uh, what we have this year. Emily was out uh, almost each month collecting data from our site at Tawaskin here, just north of the border. Um, and in the light green color, for all these figures, I'll show you as epiphyte biomass, so the algae biomass, and then the seagrass biomass. And it increases from winter to a peak in early summer, and then seagrass declines slowly, and epiphytes decline quickly. We don't have our grazers processed from this year, so I'll show you grazer trends from a couple of years ago at the same site, which I think are probably fairly representative. Um, uh, gastropods are abundant uh, early in the spring, they decline throughout the summer, and then isopods increase uh, to be abundant late. Summer. And amphipods are kind of all over the place. I can't really characterize them because they're present all the time. Um, so when we have a conceptual model like this, I think the way to start working through it is to uh, pick the points that we think might be critical. So one of them, just like the spring bloom, would be what starts it off? What starts that algae growing when it wasn't growing before? Um, another one would be a key transition. What stops it accumulating biomass uh, when it's still sunny and warm and nice out? Um, and then, of course, we might ask what influences the increasing rates and the decreasing rates. So just as an example, one hypothesis that we could uh, pose here is that the could focus on this decline um, of epiphytes or the decline of anything else in the system and say that top-down control explains seasonal declines in abundance. That's one hypothesis. 
and this would be uh, the, an alternate hypothesis would be that abiotic conditions are driving everything. Conditions were great for epiphytes, and then maybe it gets too hot or too salty or too fresh or something. <coughs> Uh, so we have a little uh, data that can speak to this hypothesis from a project that Andrew Huang did a couple of years ago in Tawasin, and he built this interaction network uh, testing the effects of great blue heron foraging uh, on lower trophic levels in our system. And he did this experimentally by excluding herons in a very clever experimental design. Herons won't take off if they can't spread their wings. So he just put up poles slightly closer together than heron wings so they wouldn't go into and he checked this every month for, um, for about five months. So basically, heron phenology um, cascades to affect lower trophic levels. So here are his observations of heron foraging. He watched how, when they were foraging, how many were foraging, what they ate, and how successful they were at actually consuming the fish. And he did some multiplication, and he estimated that in May, about 2,000 fish per day are being taken out of the eelgrass meadow, and then in July, about 10,000 fish. That's the envelope calculation. He did uh, our version of, of the popsicles, where he took um, some shrimp and glued them to ribbons that looked kind of like eelgrass, and he put those shrimp um, in and outside of his heron treatments, and he checked them. And basically, when herons were excluded, there was really no seasonal trend in the loss of grazers to fish. About 60% were lost to fish every month. When herons were present, though, there was a seasonal decline in uh, predation. So basically, it got better for inverts over time when the herons were present. Um, we have some fish, so here's the same data now. I just plotted it on our, this is the, the seasonal axes I've been showing you. Um, and now I'm also showing you some fish trap data. So basically, heron foraging increases over time, loss to fish decreases, and that's concurrent with some um, fish trap evidence on, on fish abundance in those regions. So this is experimental data. Unlike all the other seasonal data I'm showing you, which is observational field data, this is some experimental data showing us that the processes that we think matter are also changing over the season in the system. Um, and here's just uh, the same figure as before, and now I just put this um, seasonal trajectory on the bottom. I'm gonna leave it there actually because we've lost the time. So another question we might ask about um, that, about the seasonality, is what influences that rate of epiphyte increase early in the season. So in our system, um, we don't have quite enough data to address it, but Jen Rusink from Willapa Bay um, does. So actually, sort of back, so in our system through the Zen um, project, we found that adding nutrients didn't change the rate of epiphyte accumulation, so it's probably not nutrient limited. We can't speak to top-down control at that time of the year yet. Um, but another hypothesis is that something about the seagrass growth um, some aspect of it, increased habitat or the chemistry of the seagrass or something, um, is, is facilitating the epiphytes. And Jen Rusing's work showed fairly convincingly that that's actually, oops, I'm sorry, that that's actually happening in uh, Willapa Bay. So grazer trends did not explain the epiphyte growth in her model and her system, but seagrass did. Um, and the, the last, so we have, so like freshwater systems, seagrass ecologists have a lot more seasonal data than is published. Um, and I'm just going to show you a couple more uh, of these from the best studied systems that I was able to find data for, that people contributed data, just to say that, that we see similar trends in some systems. So here's this e uh, epiphyte eelgrass parallel in Bodega Harbor, which they saw in most of the sites, but not all of the examples. And here's one from the San Juan Islands where they parallel, and in fact, this blue line is seagrass productivity they measured. And consistent with Jen's results, the epiphytes are really tracking. We don't see the same thing in every system, however. Um, here's Goodwin Islands and Chesapeake. Um, I pulled this data from the Douglas paper that um, Emmett's group has produced. And here the epi epiphyte peak is much later. And this is the only figure I'm showing you where seasonal data is aggregated over many years. So a very different seasonal trend there. And um, this later trend was also seen in one of the San Francisco Bay sites. And finally, one more yet again very different uh, pattern in seasonality from uh, Otsuchi Bay near Tokyo, so it's work from Masa Nakoka's work, um, in a really, really early seasonal trend in these two variables. So uh, the differences don't frighten me. I think that what we have here is a good, uh, very interesting seasonal structure, um, and we have researchers in different places who have insights about this, and so now the challenge is hopefully to do something like the freshwater people did and understand why this is, is happening and how we can use it to understand climate change. 
So yeah, how can this help us understand change in communities? I think it can highlight critical or vulnerable aspects of temporal structure that would amplify human impacts. So maybe part of this, um, if, the, if the rate of increase is changed and the amount of algal uh, productivity that goes into that food web is changed, the whole system could be affected for quite a while afterwards. Um, it can guide decisions about how and when to sample and how to communicate our understanding. Um, and it might allow us to detect changes in secondary productivity, diversity, long-term changes. Okay, so we've made it through sort of the middle part and just in conclusion, then I want to say that to understand change, I think we need a deeper understanding of the natural history of temporal structure. And I, you know, you'll notice I didn't mention phenology except when talking about parents. So when we think about climate change and timing, we hear a lot about phenology. Um, but I see phenology, which is specifically, it's the timing of life history events. It's really a population level uh, trait, a, sing a single trait. Um, that is but one aspect of temporal structure in communities. And I talked about peak population population growth, transitions in population regulation, and their relationship to each other. And these are the building blocks of temporal structure, but alone, they don't tell us what's happening. We need to know how they're arranged and how they're organized, right? That makes a big difference. And I recently came across a quote that suggests this is, of course, not a problem only for ecology. Um, this, the C. elegance, I'm gonna talk about development again, and I mentioned before how, how much investment there has been in understanding development in biology. Understanding development was one of the main objectives of the, gene, of the project to um, find the genome of C. elegans. And the motivation was to be, again, to un, yeah, the thought was if we knew all the genes and their functions of one organism, we would understand how that organism develops in time, which is a critical biological problem. And the leader of that, one of the PIs of that project, Sidney Brenner, won the Nobel Prize in 2002 for this work with some of his colleagues. And after the project was complete, he did not feel like they had achieved that understanding of development, despite having the genome. And he said, it's not enough to just have the building blocks. We have to try to discover the principles of organization, how lots of things are put together in the same place. And I think when we're thinking about timing, it's the same uh, issue. Um, the challenge and the opportunity for natural history and ecology in the 21st century is to take the age-old interest of, that, of natural historians to observe nature over time and take those events and understand how they work together as part of the bigger system. Thanks.